This video tutorial is going to provide some tips for prepping a car for paint. Uh, these are tips that will help you eliminate many of the mistakes made when uh, spraying a car or prepping a car, getting it ready to spray. And if you'll follow these steps, you'll eliminate many of those mistakes that are often overlooked or skipped. So let's go ahead and get started. The professional paint job is not about a fancy paint gun. And I know uh, you may think that you know, the, the most important thing is your spraying techniques, you know, getting all that mastered, your overlap, and, and you know, getting everything just right in the paint booth. However, most of the uh, uh, high quality paint job, you know, starts before you ever get the car in the paint booth, and that's in your prep stages. Prep stages is perhaps the most important step that you can follow, uh, you know, to produce that high quality paint job. And one of the first things that you want to do is wash your car. You know, washing is very important, but often skipped or overlooked. I mean, you get the car in, you just want to start, you know, working on it. You want to start sanding it, you know, if you're just going to paint or if you're doing body work. However, you know, when you're sanding all that, you're just sanding and smearing that silicone and wax and greases into the paint surface. And then whenever you go to wash it before you paint it, some of that doesn't come off too good. So it's always a good idea to wash the car before you do any work to it. You want to get uh, silicones. You know, silicones come from wax. Uh, anytime if you wax your car, you're going to have silicone on there. You know, just from the environment, driving behind a diesel or just, you know, it, it's all over. You know, using armor off on your tires or your interior. You know, the silicones become airborne and they stick to your paint. And it's necessary to get that off. And if you don't, you know, you're going to have problems like fish eyes. You know, when you go to painting, you're going to may have paint failures. There's just a lot of problems that's not necessary. These can be eliminated. And uh, you want to wash it, you know, wash anything that's going to be painted, you know, really, really good before you start. Now, some people may not like to use dish soap. You know, I've used dish soap for a long time. It works well, but there is something you need to look for. You know, there are some dish soaps that have hand ingredients in it to help keep your hands soft or moist or whatever that is you know if it has any of that in it you're going to be contaminating the paint with those products so you want to make sure it's just a, a dish soap that doesn't have any of that in there now you can use a car soap as well but there are a lot of car soaps that have silicone and waxes in it to help prevent from stripping your waxes off now you don't want that you want to strip the the, the wax off the car so make sure the car soap does not have anything, you know, have any silicones in it or anything that tries to protect your, your wax. And, uh, you know, uh, the, your, your instructor or your supervisor, you know, where you work or go to school at, I'm sure they already have a, a method that they use or, you know, the type of soap. But uh, if you're DIY, you know, be sure and keep those things in mind. You want to use a dish soap that has no ingredients to keep your hands soft or a car soap that has no silicones to protect your wax. So you're going to wash your car really good. And then you want to do another step and uh, to assure all wax and grease contaminants are off. And that's to wipe the area that you're going to be painting with wax and grease remover. And uh, you, put, you put the wax and grease remover on there and wipe it off. And this just assures that all traces of contaminants are removed from the paint surface. So once all that is done, now you can continue your, your prepping st steps, but make sure that you do this first. Now this may have done been done before you even started the body work, and that's fine. Just make sure that you do start, you know, you do follow those steps before uh, you start sanding and everything. Uh, give you a little example, put this in perspective a little bit. Let's say that you are going to prep a car, and you're going to prep it for an excellent painter. You know, let's just say Chip Foose. You know, from overhauling, you know, he's well known for his spraying abilities, his artistic abilities, his airbrush. I mean, just really very talented person. Well, he's going to spray the car for you, but that's all he's going to do is walk in the booth and spray it. And your job is to prep it and get it ready for him. And you, you know, you don't wash the car before you start on it. You, you don't sand it really good. Uh, when you come masking time, you just kind of throw some masking paper on there and, you know, tape it up a little bit. Then he comes in there with all of his ability and gives his, you know, everything he has to pr producing a, a top-notch, high-quality paint job. Well, what do you think it's, the car's going to look like? You know, car pickup or whatever you're painting. It's going to look horrible. 
I mean, there's going to be dirt in it where you didn't wash good. There's going to be fish eyes where all the silicones wasn't removed. You know, areas where it wasn't sanded good may have a paint adhesion failure where it starts peeling. You know, where you didn't mask good, you're going to see overspray. I mean, it's just going to look horrible. It would look like a, you know, an amateur sprayed that car, even though it's someone with that much talent. So with that said, you know, that kind of puts it in a different perspective to where the prepping has to be done right in order for the spraying to be right. Now, if you prepped that car and you did a really good job, and then someone real talented sprayed it, you know, that's it's going to be a different story. It's going to look awesome. So anyway, I just want to stress that a little bit. Cleaning is so important. Uh, you're going to clean it, you know, before you start working and sanding. You're going to wash it before you paint it, you know, after, after all the sanding has been done. So, you know, prepping is a lot of washing. So that's a, just wanted to stress that out a little bit and make sure that, you know, I pointed that out because this is often overlooked. You know, you, you do not want to skip that step. Once it's all washed and, and contaminants are off, you know, then we can continue our, our repair process. Now, in another video, we talked about, you know, dent repair, we re repaired a dent, and then we put body filler on, and then we finish it out with 150. Now, it doesn't have to be 150. There's a range of, of grits of sandpaper that you can use anywhere between 150 and 180 or even 220. You know, and that range is used to finish out the body filler before applying primer surfacer. So for this example, this video, we're just going to say it's sanded with 150 and it's ready for primer. However, you know, where you grinded the paint to put the body filler, that edge, you know, you have a really hard edge there. We need to smooth that out somehow. And also, when you was blocking, you may have blocked past your body filler area and uh, scratched your paint surface with uh, whatever you're sanding with. It could be 36, 80, 150, and you're going to have scratches in the paint that will need to be smoothed out as well. So what these, these areas are going to have to be sanded out. And uh, the way we do this, or the, what we call this, is feather edging. That's where you take that edge, you know, where your grinder was, your paint edge, and you basically make a hard edge and you turn it into a smooth edge and you're basically layering each layer of paint so when you do this you want to see each layer of paint for example uh, on a car you're going to have your your undercoatings you know a primer you're going to have your color and clear coat all those are different layers of paint and uh, you want to try to to layer each one at least a quarter of an inch it can be more but try to you want to be able to see each layer of paint at least a quarter of an inch. That way you know it's going to be a smooth transition from your bare metal to the top of your clear coat. If you don't do that, if you don't get that smooth and feather edge that out, uh, you're probably going to be able to see that after it's painted. You know, you're going to look at it at an angle and see a little wave there uh, or a ring. You know, that's due to not proper feather edging. Or if there was some scratches that you didn't sand out and you prime and block it, it may look good at that point. But if that primer shrinks a little bit, you know, it's going to shrink, in, shrink inside of those scratches, and then you're going to be able to see sand scratches there. So uh, we're going to feather edge around there to get that good and uh, smooth, a real smooth transition. You, uh, you can think of it like uh, layering the paint, you know, feathering the paint, whatever, ha whatever you, however you want to think about that, but uh, that, that's the process that we're doing. And to do that, we are going to use a uh, DA sander, a dual action sander, and 220 grit sandpaper. And uh, in this photo here, if, if you look, there's a DA, there's some sandpaper. Uh, that's 500 grit sandpaper. That's for final sanding. We want to use 220 grit. And there's an interface pad. Now, we don't want to use the interface pad for feather edging because feather edging is basically the process of leveling out the paint surfaces. Anytime you're leveling, a harder surface is going to work better. Now this uh, interface pad is real soft so you know that's not going to work well for that. Now that will work well when we do our final sanding and we don't want to get marks from the DA you know from the edge of it digging into the paint and causing little uh, swirl marks or anything like that. That interface pad works excellent for that. But for feather edging just use the DA and sandpaper and that will level out those uh, the, the feather edge better than uh, using the pad. So anyway, then we're going to 
got that all each layer out a quarter of an inch. Now we want to talk about you know why do we sand? You know we talk about sanding a lot, of course. And we've been talking about you know leveling and and uh, but let's say that's a, a area that doesn't have any body work. Why do we sand that? You know we don't need to shape that or, or level it or anything like that. And I wanted to mention that because there is a you know confusion about that because I hear a lot or I've heard you know that well you got to sand it to smooth it up and, and you know that's actually the opposite of that. You're sanding it to rough it up, you know, because you're providing uh, sandpaper has a grit in it, and you're actually putting small little scratches. It's fine scratches for final sanding, but you're putting fine little scratches so when that paint will f fall on those scratches and give it something to bite to, to hold on to, that that way it doesn't peel. You know, you have good adhesion. So we're actually sanding to rough the surface up. Uh, just kind of wanted to mention that. So, uh, you know, there's no confusion there. Uh, when you're sanding, you basically, when you're selecting a grit, you want to select one that does the fastest job with the least amount of effort. Now, depending on what you're spraying, you know, it's going to determine the grit also. So, for primer, like I mentioned, anywhere from 150 to 220, that primer is going to fill those with no problem and, and block out, you know, primer surfacer. Paint, you know, you would see the scratches if you sprayed paint if you sprayed paint over 150 grit you're gonna see those scratches so we've got to go with something finer and for spraying paint you know manufacturers may vary a little bit and uh, this is um, this is in reference to solvent paint you know in this video but a range of from anywhere to 400 grit to 600 grit so your base coat is going to fill those scratches so 600 will work it's going to take a little more effort 400 will work as well, takes less, less effort. So, and then if you're clear coating, if you're not putting any paint on and you're just clear coating, if you use 400 grit scratches, you're going to see through that and you're going to see the scratches. So, you got to go with something finer. So, anywhere from 8 to 1200, you know, if you sand it with that, you're not going to see the uh, scratches through the clear coat. Now, you're going to have to work a little bit harder because it's a finer grit, but, you know, the, it'll all achieve the same thing so just wanted to, to touch on that a little bit mechanical adhesion and this just kind of a uh, you know expands on sanding a car to, to provide that tooth for it it's a mechanical adhesion you know if the if the paint was not sanded and it's just that real glossy smooth finish you know it'd peel off because there's no mechanical adhesion uh, you can imagine painting a piece of glass, you know, it's so smooth it wouldn't stick, it'd just peel off. And that's the uh, same way with the car. If we didn't sand it, you know, the coatings that we put on top are just going to peel off. So when we sand it, we put those little scratches in it, we provide a mechanical adhesion. And then we have, you know, good adhesion, it won't peel on us. Okay, in, in this, uh, we're going to talk about painting the entire panel. And, uh, you know, there's different ways of, uh, of doing this. This is, this is, for example, if you got a, let's say you have a brand new panel and it had a ding in it when it came in, but you're going to be painting the entire panel. Uh, this is the process that, that you would use. You know, in a minute we're going to talk about blending within a panel where you may not be painting the whole panel. You're going to clear coat the whole panel, but not paint. And that's a different process that we'll talk about. But let's take this uh, fender that we had a dent in, we dent in it. We uh, finished the body work at, with 150 grit. And that's the first little circle. Now you may have to use your imagination here with my uh, graphics here, but uh, the first little circle is 150 grit. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to feather edge each layer of paint out at least a quarter of an inch. You know where you can see those layers a quarter of an inch, and that's the next few rings in there. You know where it's layered out, and then uh, we're going to do that with 220 grit. And then the area that we're going to paint. Uh, Anywhere we're going to paint, we're going to use, you know, like I said, anywhere from four to 600. We may sand past our 220 grit area, a little bigger area with 320, you know, where the primer is going to go. And the, the method I'm telling you, you know, this is not the only method. You know, your instructor or supervisor may have a little different method that they use. But I generally like to uh, go ahead and prep the whole panel and sand the whole panel 
you know, before I do any priming. And the reason I think that's a good idea is if any overspray gets on the unsanded, you know, it lands pat, you know, sometimes when you're priming, it just gets a little bigger than you intended. And if it's not sanded underneath the primer, that primer is going to peel. So even though you sanded the primer and it smoothed up and looks good and feathered in, uh, if it's not stuck to the paint good, it's going to peel later. So this way, if you have it all sanded, if your primer spot does get a little bigger than you intended, you know, it's still going to be on a sanded uh, surface that has mechanical adhesion. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, you know, go ahead and sand that and then uh, out past where I, where I feather edged, I'm going to hit it with a little bit of 320 and that's where the primer, you know, primer is going to be at. And then the rest of the panel, we're going to paint that entire panel so we can just paint it, uh, sand it with four to 600. Uh, if you're wet sand sanding, you know, you can use 400 grit because it takes less effort. And again, you may check with your paint manufacturer to see what they recommend. But for the paints I use, 400 grit works real well. And the base coat covers that. You know, you don't see any scratches through it. Uh, you can use up to 600. And 600 will achieve the same result, but it's just going to take a little bit more effort to get it there. Uh, you can also use a DA sander, a dual action sander, to do your final sanding. Uh, 500 works real well for that. Uh, it is a finer grit, but it works so much faster. You know, it's going to take a lot less effort than the, the wet sanding by hand. So we're going to go ahead and sand that entire fender. Then we can do our priming, our blocking, and then we, you know, it'll be ready for paint. Okay, now we're going to talk about blending within a panel. And the same steps are going to be followed for the priming and blocking. You know, we've got our 150 grit, and then we've got, got our where we uh, DA, you know, feather edge. And uh, where we prime, we're going to hit some 320 and then go out with 500. Every, you know, the area's going to be painted. Now, the outside circle there is the area that we're going to spray paint. And that's what's going to be sanded with the 500 or you know four to six hundred you know depending on your preference now we're gonna go ahead and clear coat that whole panel though but we don't want to sand that with the four to six hundred or you will be able to see through the clear coat and see the scratches now there are some painters that I've talked to that that uh, have said they they put uh, the clear coat over six hundred grit scratches and don't have any problems uh, I don't recommend that I, I've, I've never done that but uh, I prefer doing it anywhere between 8 and, and 1200 grit. I usually use 800 grit. The clears I use cover those scratches fine and you never see those scratches. So the entire panel, I'm going to final sand with 800 grit sandpaper. Uh, you can do, again, you can do that wet or dry. You can use a DA. But there are a few things you got to be very careful about whenever sanding a, a panel just for clear coat. You do want to get your edges really good because remember if the paint's going to peel, it's going to start from the edges. So make sure all the edges are good. But you got to be very careful not to sand through. You don't want to sand through your clear coat or your paint because if you just clear coat over that, you know, there's no paint. There's nothing going to cover that. If you sand it through, you're going to see that through your clear coat. So you got to be very careful not to sand through. And that's another reason uh, I'd be very careful you know, if I was trying 600 grit, be very careful not to sand through any edges. Uh, if you're afraid you may sand through some edges, you may use 1000 grit, you know, to uh, that'll provide a little extra uh, work there before you ha would sand through. Um, when painting, you know, a red scuff pad works. You know, you can use a red scuff pad to get the hard to get areas, your edges, and things like that but that is a little too coarse you'll see those scratches just through you know where you're clear coating so where just clear coat is going to be applied you can use a gray scuff pad a gray scotch bright scotch bright to get your edges and hard to get areas uh, you know where clear coat is going to be applied so if you'll follow these uh, sanding techniques and assure all the edges are sanded good uh, you know, you'll eliminate peeling, you know, the peeling problems. And that's, uh, you see a lot of, of uh, you know, improper sanding is not the only reason for peeling. There's some other uh, peeling reasons paint will peel, you know, which we, we're probably not going to get into in the prepping video. But 
one of the most common problems or issues for paint peeling is, you know, because it wasn't sanded good in that area, you know, so, it, you know, I see a lot of times, you know, the, the main areas, the centers of areas get sanded extremely good and the edges, you know, the hard to get places uh, don't get sanded hardly at all. And it should be not, not necessarily the opposite because you do want the, the bigger areas to be sanded good, but you want those edges sanded good as well. So if you want to eliminate peeling, you know, make sure that you're, you sand really good. And an easy way to tell if an area is sanded well is if it uh, looks dull. Because when you sand something, it gives it a dull appearance. If you uh, clean your car off and you see a real glossy spot or a glossy edge, uh, you know, you need to go back and hit that area either with the, you know, the 4 to 600 grit sandpaper or with the scuff pad. Uh, or if you're clear coating, you know, you'd want to use a finer grit, just depending on, you know, what you're doing to that area. But, you know, want to try to make sure there's no glossy areas uh, left, and that will uh, assure that you're going to get proper adhesion. Now, we're going to talk about masking, and in, th in this photo, you see where it's masked off square like that. That's something that you don't want to do, is make a really hard edge around your uh, repair area. And the reason this is done is to keep your primer area small. Now, what, an, another method for doing that is just to, uh, uh, you know, mask off adjacent panels and moldings. But like for that area, you know, just turn your pressure down, make a smaller pattern, and don't mask anything. You know, if it's not necessary to mask it, you know, I kind of leave it open, and that way your primer will kind of feather itself out. Now, if you did mask a square edge like this. Uh, you would not want to prime all the way to that tape edge because that would leave a hard edge and those hard edges are hard to sand off it takes a lot of extra time a lot of extra effort and I've even seen where you sand those edges off and after it's painted you still see that edge a little bit so uh, one method that, I, that I've seen used you know is back masking and that's where you uh, flip the paper around where the back ad edge of the tape kind of makes a softer edge but still if you're masking if you're spraying all the way that edge it's going to make an edge that's going to be hard to sand off so I kind of like the the primer just to kind of feather out onto the paint you know rather than have these these squares around it so I've seen this a lot I'm sure you've seen cars riding around that have these little squares you know that masked off or primer spots on them but that's going to cause a lot of problems when they go to sanding and you know possibly might even see it through the paint Again, has this car been painted? And we're talking about masking. You know, one of the easiest indications to, to determine if a car has been painted is by the way it was masked. And you, the thing about it is you don't have to be a trained professional to see this. You know, if you see a jam that has a real hard edge on it, or around some of your moldings have, you know, overspray or primer or paint on them, I mean, anybody can see that. So it's a very easy way to determine if a car has been painted. So. I know a lot of, you know, you may think that, uh, you know, masking is not that important when in the, in the overall picture and, you know, rush through those steps, but actually this is uh, something that you want to do, you know, really good, take your time doing it, so that when, after the car's painted, even though the car looks good, you can't tell that it's been painted, because the objective of making a repair is to make an invisible repair, and that's where you cannot tell that the car's been painted, and, uh, so take your time when masking and, and you know do a really good job with that. Now we're going to start talking about primers and there's different primers for different things that you're going to be doing. Uh, for example, or for corrosion protection, you know, for bare metal, you want a certain primer. Uh, whenever you're filling scratches or body work, you want a certain primer. And then for color hiding, you know, for uh, covering what's underneath, you know, you want a primer sealer. So I've got a little chart, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now in this first column, you're going to see corrosion protection. Anytime you have bare metal, you know, you can't just put regular primer surface on top of that. You know, there's a, one of these three primers can be used. And you can use a self-edge primer, and that's a one-part primer that has acid in it, and the acid bites to the metal, and it does provide corrosion protection. Uh, this is a uh, fat, you know, it's fast to use this method. It's real quick. A lot of your production shops that do a lot of work use this because it is a lot faster than the next one, that epoxy. 
Now epoxy works really good. Um, it's probably the superior, the, you know, for corrosion protection. But the disadvantage of epoxy is a little bit slower. I mean, it's a two-part primer that you have to mix. It's a little bit slower drying. I mean, it takes a little bit longer uh, to use the epoxy than the self 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 etch. So, production shops may uh, prefer the self etch primer. Restoration or DIY, you know, it's probably going to lean towards the epoxy. And then there's a third uh, method, and that's direct to metal. And what this is is it's a primer that has the corrosion protection in it. It has an acid that bites into the metal a little bit, but then it's also a primer surfacer. So any primer surfacer has to be sanded. So this does has to be does ha this has to be sanded if you use this. But if you have body work and some metal, you can put this over over it, let it dry, and sand it out. So that's another method that you can use. So three different methods. And also I'd like to mention if you look at the very bottom of this, you'll see an arrow going from you know bare metal to sealer. If you don't have any scratches or body work that you're trying to fill the scratches in, you don't need to use primer surfacer. That is just to fill scratches. So if you had a, a you stripped a fender down to metal and put some epoxy on it or self etch primer, whatever method you use, you know you could go straight to the last step and you could either you know use a primer sealer or you could top coat it, you know, depending on your paint system, what your paint manufacturer recommends. Uh, a lot of times the epoxy, you know, is used as a sealer. So if you epoxy it, you know, you've already sealed it also, so you don't have to, you know, you just basically skip that center section. Okay, the center is for filling imperfection. This is for uh, minor imperfections, scratches, you know, from, from the 220 and 150 grit all that you got to get all that out of there and get it smooth and that's what this is for anytime you do body work you need to use uh, primer surfacer and there's basically these three that you can use uh, you can use a 2k primer surfacer that's a primer that mixes with the catalyst and uh, you know that's probably the the what you use the most you know it works real well but there's also a 1k primer surfacer and this is still used some, but it was, uh, you know, like lacquer, you know, it's what this makes me think of because uh, uh, for a long time, that's all we had was lacquer primer. Everybody used it, and it was a 1K. You know, it works. It shrinks more. You know, if you have scratches, it might shrink up in the scratches. You know, it's not near as good as the 2K, but, it, you know, it, it is uh, something that worked for many years. And then we have the direct metal. So if you already applied to the direct metal in step one, uh, you don't need to apply more for step two. You know, you just, uh, you know, sand it. And then we have primer sealer. And uh, there's different primer sealers that paint manufacturers make. And also epoxies a lot of time is used as sealer, uh, primer sealer. So, and what a sealer is for is to hide imperfection. So, for example, if we are spraying a dark red metallic that has a lot of metallics, you know, something that has a lot of metallic doesn't have a lot of pigment. And pigment is the color, so it doesn't hide real good. So if we've got a, a gray spot from the primer, and we put some paint over that gray spot, it's not going to cover it too good. It's going to take a lot of coats to finally get that to uh, completely hide that gray spot. Well, we use silver. You know, we use a silver that's about the same shade, you know, that's darker. You know, it'll help hide that. So you put that sealer on that gray spot, and now we only have to use a couple of coats of paint. So that's what primer sealer is for. It's for hiding what's underneath. So, you know, there's a, there are a few other combinations out there. I don't want to get too confusing. It's just kind of keeping it basic. But uh, there are some primer surfacers that are tenable. And uh, very, you, if you're painting a dark color, you know, you would tint it. It would be a dark primer. So after it's sanded, you already got the darker spot. So you can, you don't have to use the primer sealer. Uh, most paint manufacturers do, you know, recommend primer sealer. But I just uh, uh, recommend that you, you know, look for the P pages or technical data sheet for the specific paint line that you're using and uh, see what they recommend. And another thing I want to mention is like, like using the epoxy 
or self etch, you know, this the first column for corrosion protection. That does not need to be sanded. You allow it to flash, and then you put your primer surfacer. And then you let it dry, and it has to be sanded. And then you apply your primer sealer, and you allow it to flash, and then you paint. So you don't sand your primer sealer, and you don't. Uh, you don't sand your self etch or epoxy primer. You can spray straight over those. So anyway, I hope this uh, kind of helps you uh, understand what the different primers are used for. Now we uh, got it ready. You know, you got it all ready to spray. Got it all feather edged and final sanded. And now we're going to start spraying primer. Wipe the area with wax and grease remover to. You know, make sure the area that you're going to be priming is clean of all contaminants. You're going to want to mask the area off so you don't get overspray uh, on adjacent panels. Uh, a lot of times it's a good idea to go ahead and drop a sheet of plastic over the entire car, you know, if you're priming a bigger area. You know, you want to prevent overspray from getting on areas that should be. Uh, like I mentioned, I don't like putting the little squares around the repair areas. You know, if that is a method that you use, be sure and do the back masking. And try not to prime all the way to the edge. And then the, whenever you start applying the, the primers, uh, self-edge, you know, that's generally used real light coats. You don't want to put that on too heavy because it has that acid in it. You know, that could bite into your paint and cause lifting problems or something like that. So be sure and put that on, you know, one to two light coats. Epoxy, that goes over most coatings you know without any problems uh, usually one to two coats you know look at your P pages to determine what the specific product that you're using but usually one to two coats is sufficient and then allow that to flash then you're going to spray your primer surfacer on any areas you did body work or where there's scratches and usually two to three coats is recommended again look at your P pages so you're gonna put your epoxy allow that to flash for 30 minutes put your two coats of uh, primer servicer allowing five to ten minutes depending on you know what your P pages say between coats now it's important to wait between that flash time so you put two coats on and then you gotta stop let the primer servicer and then allow it to dry then block sand it so I keep mentioning flash times I want to expand on that just a little bit uh, to help clear that up. Uh, when you spray something on there it has solvents in it and that solvent has to evaporate you know it has to evaporate out of the surface. If you, if, you, if you don't, if you just put one coat on top of another you're gonna trap those solvents in there and they're gonna come out eventually but when they do you know it may cause uh, different types of problems. It may cause adhesion problems, solvent popping, uh, a lot of different things so be sure to look at your P pages or technical data sheet for the product you're using and allow the proper time for flash. If it says five minutes, allow it to flash for five minutes. And another thing to consider, if it says allow to flash for five minutes, uh, whenever they did that study, most of them use around 70 degree weather. Well, if you're in a shop that's 60 degrees, you may allow it to dry a little bit longer. You know, if it's a 100 degrees, you know, it may not take quite as long. So. Uh, something to think about and be sure and look at uh, your P pages to determine what that time is, the flash time. So we've got flash time and we've got a window time. Now these are different. So let's talk about the epoxy because it has a real long window and what that is is how long you have to recode it without sanding. So with epoxy, you know, the one I use uh, you have to wait 30 minutes, allow that to flash, you know, allow that the solvents to escape for 30 minutes, and then you can put your primer surfacer. But let's say that uh, you get it epoxied and it's closing time, you go home. Can you come back the next morning and spray primer surfacer? Well, with this, you can because you have 72 hours. If you spray on top of that within 72 hours, you do not have to sand it because you've got that chemical adhesion period. If you wait longer than 72 er, uh, hours, you're going to have to provide that mechanical adhesion. So you're going to have to come back and sand it. So flash time is how long you have to wait. Window is how long you have before having to re 
uh, sand before recoating. So epoxies generally have a, a long window like that. Some base coats, you know, are 24 hours. But again, this is going to be different on all products. So let's check the P pages on that. Mechanical versus chemical adhesion. Well, we've talked a lot about mechanical adhesion that provides that tooth, you know, that roughs up the paint so that the paint has something to stick to, you know. And the chemical adhesion is done chemically. That's where two chemicals still bond together without the scratches, you know, without that, that tooth to bite to. And chemical adhesion is only going to last so long, and that's the window time. Once that's gone, your, chem your chemical adhesion, you know, you don't have it anymore, you're going to have to provide mechanical. That's why we have to re-sand. So mechanical is, is produced by sanding. Chemical is a period of time you have where the chemicals will bond together. Okay, let's talk, get back on the, uh, we got the primer surfacer sprayed, now we need to block sand it. And I generally use 320 grit, block it out, and you know, you want to use a block because we're trying to level the surface, make sure that all imperfections are smoothed up, and all scratches are removed. Now, the best way to do this is use, to use what you call a guide coat. And this is a, comes in dry form, that you, like a powder you put on there, on the primer area. Or they also have spray that you spray on there. And you want it to be a contrasting color. For example, if it's a gray primer, you know, you can use a black guide coat. And what that does is just helps you identify any highs or lows. If there's a scratch, you know, and you're using a block, it's going to stay in that scratch. And you can see, well, I haven't sanded all the guide coat off. So I need to either continue sanding. Sometimes you may have to reprime. Uh, what you don't want to do is think the main objective is to sand all of the guide coat off because I've seen many times where there might be some guide coat a little bit a little low or scratch or something and you, and, uh, you know start tilting the block over trying to sand it out well that's uh, defeating the whole purpose of guide coat if you're gonna tilt the block to sand it out uh, you're basically sanding that that a uh, low area or scratch you know it's gonna be low where you sanded it so if the guide coat stays there, that's good. It's doing its job. And sometimes you can sand till it sands out. But if you start sanding through the primer, you know, you need to stop. It's going to have to be primed again to fill that area. So, and another tip when block sanding is uh, to use longer sanding strokes. Don't do real choppy short strokes because after it's painted, you know, it may look, give it kind of a choppy appearance. So use longer sanding strokes and continue to use the cross sanding uh, method that helps level to assure everything's good and level and there won't be any wavy areas you know that you that are not noticeable after the car has been painted then once you've blocked you're going to start final sanding and again final sanding depending if the, the entire area is going to be painted or just clear coated it's going to determine the grit but final sanding is the last step you do as far as sanding and uh, again if you're going to be painting like if you're painting an entire car you're going to sand the entire car with four to six hundred and uh, make sure to get the edges good hard to get areas use a red scuff pad if you're just doing a spot and you're just going to clear coat the rest of the panel Say you're doing a blend job or you're going to clear coat a couple of panels, you know, prep that spot out, you know, with 500 where paint's going to be applied. And the rest of it, you know, use 8 to 1200 grit uh, to where only clear coat is going to be applied. And again, make sure all your edges are sanded good. Sanded good. Be careful not to sand through any of the edges because that will show through the clear. And don't use a red scuff pad where only clear coat is going to be applied for your hard to get areas and uh, edges you can use a gray scuff pad masking for paint um, again we talked about the importance of this and how if it's not masked properly it's a good identifier that the car has been painted so uh, we need to properly mask a car to make that invisible repair that we've talked about uh, you want to start masking your jams first you want to start inside out because if you start outside in, you may trap yourself to where uh, 
the whole side of the car glass is masked off and you have to cut it open to get the door open so it's always a good idea to, to mask the jams first now before you start masking the jams make sure that you wipe all the jams really good with wax and grease remover or the tapes not going to stick well so clean the jams really good and then uh, one method is just like you see in this picture where we're using inch and a half tape we're putting it over there and then we're folding it backwards where it makes a smoother edge there's not a straight tip, tape line edge there. This is called back masking. That way whenever the paint folds around the corner, and you do want it to come around the corner just a little bit the edge, or else you're going to see that line. So as, it, as, as the paint uh, sprays around that corner about a quarter of an inch, then it's going to hit that tape edge, and it's going to make a smoother edge, you know, a less noticeable edge. That's one method. They also have aperture tape. Uh, this is a foam tape, and it, it works well for doing your jams. You basically put, uh, you know, you clean your jam, and then you put this foam tape along the edge. Then when you shut your door or hood or trunk or whatever, it makes a seal that seals off the interior. And this is this works really well for masking off jams. This is probably the most common used method for masking jams. Then they also make a special tape. Um, for this, this just a thin piece of plastic tape, and in the center it has adhesive, and then on each side of that adhesive, you know, is just a piece of plastic which uh, provides a, a, a real smooth line, you know, where the paint doesn't make a real hard edge. And uh, you can use a couple of layers of this along the jams. You can put a coat on, peel the first layer off, put the second coat on, or second coat of a uh, coating on and then you know you can kind of layer it that way to where you can almost make an invisible line with this I mean it works real well I've even seen guys use this on body lines you know like you, uh, if they're going to be painting a partial panel you know that's usually not recommended but it does it, it, you know it almost makes an invisible line where you can do that this works really good it's a uh, little more probably a little more expensive than the other methods but this is a method that can be used and, and I just want to mention several different methods you know at your school or your uh, where you're working at you know they may use one of these different methods and I uh, just want you to be a little bit familiar with them anyway that wraps up this video I want to thank you for watching this and again I want to mention that uh, you know that there's a lot of ways to do this that I'm just mentioning some of the ways uh, I want you to you know discuss this with your supervisor instructor to see if these are the steps if anything varies be sure and write it down and put it in a notebook so you'll have a reference to follow and you know kind of have the procedures that uh, your school or your place of work uses and that way you'll have something to look at you know if you ever get a little get, bit confused or you're not for sure you'll have have it you know you have it right there with you and if you're DIY um, you know this is a some steps here I have a, a more detailed uh, Kindle book it's available on Amazon and if you just go to Amazon type in Donnie Smith and look for one for paint prep you know that's it and it it's, goes into a lot more detail this video is just a quick overview and uh, that book gives more step-by-step -step and has a lot of resources and additional videos that you can to help further you know understand prepping but for whatever reason you're watching this video whether you're you know new at this if you're a beginner uh, just started got out of school working at a shop or you're in school you're a student or you're DIY you know I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video and uh, be, have any questions be sure and leave a comment below and we'll try to get it answered for you thanks for watching and have a good day